Hi, it's Heather from Thicket Works, and today I want to share a very special collaborative project that I've created along with my friend Shirley Ping. Shirley has written a wonderful love story entitled If the Reaper Rides. Shirley tells me that this thrilling tale was inspired by the Thicket Works series of Victorian Gothic miniatures. You'll find a link in the description to all of the free downloadable printables, including the full manuscript, the cover graphic, marbled end papers, and cool graphics for the presentation box or book stand to house your treasure. Make sure to visit the accompanying blog post on the Thicket Works website in order to obtain all your free downloadable printables and special video instructions that walk you through the process of printing out a two-sided booklet. Once you've printed out your two-sided book pages, it's time to separate them into individual leaves. This is done using a paper trimmer or a very sharp craft knife and a metal ruler and cutting right down the center of each of the pages. Once you've made that initial cut, take all of the pages on the left-hand side of your cut stack and place them in reverse order. Do the same thing for all the pages on the right-hand side of your cut stack. Make sure to keep these two stacks separated as you continue cutting each of the layers of the book. Continue collating the pages in reverse order, keeping the left and right hand stacks separate from each other until you complete the entire stack of pages. Once you've done that, place them face to face, and now all of your book pages are in the proper order. To make certain that the text block will fit neatly within the confines of the book cover we'll be creating, we need to trim away a small amount of material from the right margin. In this case, I'm setting my cutting blade at five and a quarter inches to remove a quarter of an inch of material. And then I'm taking half an inch of material off the bottom of all of the book pages. If you have a book press, now's the time to use it, but if you don't, you can improvise one like I did using oversized craft sticks and lining up the left-hand margin of the pages between two of these sticks that are then clamped firmly together. Leave between an eighth and a quarter of an inch of the page edges protruding beyond the edge of the jumbo craft sticks in order to make the gluing process easier. Apply a thick layer of PVA glue and once it's in place, slide the sticks up so that the edges of the pages are contained within them and then reclamp. Allow this to dry for several hours and then repeat the process with another layer of PVA glue. Allow the glue to cure thoroughly before proceeding. Once the adhesive has thoroughly cured, it's time to remove the clamps and take a look at our perfect binding. Be gentle as you remove the craft sticks and just make sure that you're not tearing any of the pages that might have become adhered to the wood. The layers of PVA should have cured to a nice firm consistency with a smooth edge that holds the pages firmly in place. If they appear loose to you, repeat the procedure. Next, it's time to prepare our marbled end papers. My printer doesn't allow me to print all the way to the edge, so my next task is to remove all of the white margins around the edges of these pages. I designed this book so that it would be bound comfortably with a single sheet of eight and a half by 11 medium weight chipboard. This is why it was necessary to remove material off the right hand and bottom margin of the text block. Use the dimensions of the text block to determine where you can remove a small strip of material from the center 
of your chipboard. My strip turns out to be about a quarter of an inch wide. This will allow the text block to nestle comfortably within the confines of our book cover. A single sheet of cardstock will be used to create the graphic cover for this volume. And that means that a certain amount of the margin of the chipboard will be revealed because the cardstock won't be large enough to cover the entire piece. That's why I'm using an oil-based paint pen to create a black margin around three sides of both the front and the back cover on the exterior and the interior. You can do whatever you'd like from painting to using patterned paper to cover this area, but I wanted to use gold embossing. So I'm turning to Versamark, a beautiful stamp, and some Zing embossing powder in a rich gold color to obtain beautiful scroll work pattern over the black paint. That will create a lovely background for the edges where our book cover will not completely cover the chipboard. As you may have guessed, it's now time to trim away the white margins from the book cover graphic. A dry fit shows how the graphic is highlighted against the gold embossed areas. I'm adding a margin of walnut stain distress ink around the outer edges of the book cover graphic and then coating the entire piece with a good quality clear coat. Two sheets of plain printer paper are folded in half and used to help prepare the text block for the final binding process. Each of these sheets will be added on either side of the text block and then trimmed to make sure that they fit perfectly. On top of that layer, we'll fold and trim the marbled in papers so that they create a sandwich around the existing text block and the plain printer pages that we've already prepared. These sheets will be glued directly to the text block only along the bound edge of the pages with a very thin margin of glue. I'll be using Aileen's Fast Grab Tacky Glue for this operation. Apply a thin bead of the adhesive directly on the cover page and then align your folded plain printer paper on top of the adhesive and align it carefully with the edge of the binding. Use a bone folder to firmly press it in place and then open out the page and press it again. Repeat this process for the marbled end paper, which gets adhered directly on top of the folded plain printer paper. Once you've smoothed all these papers into place, you can consider whether or not you'd like to add a ribbon bookmark. I'm adding a length of black rayon seam binding tape to my text block to act as a bookmark. This will be glued directly along the upper portion of the spine and can then be drawn down between the pages. I'm using full strength PVA glue to hold the bookmark firmly in place. Now I'll draw it down between the pages and pull it snug. If you'd like to smooth out the fore edge of your text block, bind it firmly in a book press or between two rigid pieces like these ceramic tiles. That will hold the pages firmly in place and allow us to sand them either with an emery board, like you see me doing here, or regular sandpaper. Once the page edges have been sanded, you can riffle through them to dislodge any dust. And touch-ups are easy. You can now just come along with the edge of your emery board and clean away any small remaining bits of paper fiber. Use the completed text block to determine the space required between the front and back 
book boards. I'm measuring mine and then firmly taping both the front and back book board to my work surface. This will allow them to stay in place while I add adhesive and a small strip of plain white muslin. This will make certain that the spine of our book stays flexible and strong for years to come. The fabric is pressed into place over a thin layer of Fabri-Tac adhesive. PVA glue is added over the top and allowed to cure. The next step is to attach the text block to the book boards. For this, we'll be using a layer of full strength Aileen's Tacky Glue. Make sure to center the text block between the book boards. Apply the Tacky Glue to the unprinted side of the marbled end paper. Hold the text block vertically and then fold the marble in paper down onto the chipboard. A firm but flexible tool like a Bondo spreader is ideal for helping to remove any wrinkles or air pockets. I always recommend that if you have access to a laser printer, you use that for your graphics. That will make the printed images much more robust. But if all you have access to is an inkjet printer, the use of a good quality clear coat sprayed on after the print is fully dry will help to protect the print from smearing and scratches. Repeat this procedure on the other set of marbled end pages, applying the adhesive, pressing the printed page against the chipboard book cover, and then firmly but gently removing all wrinkles and air pockets using a flexible tool. Try to avoid getting any adhesive along the exposed fabric at the spine area. Insert wax paper or another non-stick surface between the pages before weighting them down and allowing the volume to cure completely. By the next day, this little volume has dried thoroughly and the covers are straight and true. I love the way it turned out. It feels amazing to hold this in your hands, but the best is yet to come because the next step, as you may have guessed, is to add the graphic to the exterior of the cover and then dive into embellishing. My cover graphic was printed on regular weight cardstock, distress inks added along the exterior edges, and a spray sealer over the top. Now it's time to glue it directly over our embellished book boards. Carefully align the cover with the underlying book board, maintaining the same amount of revealed margin as consistently as you can across the top, side, and bottom edges. Then fold the cardstock over the spine and then adhere it into place on the back book board. Again, being careful not to apply adhesive against the actual spine. We want that to remain free. Don't worry if you get a little bit of PVA exposed along the edges. You can wipe that up easily as soon as you've pressed the covers into place. And then, yep, back into the press it goes for another curing session. By the following day, the book has cured into a firmly bound, beautiful little hard case book that you created. I chose this resin casting of an iron orchid design decor mold to create the focal point for my little volume. And then I decided to use triple thick and these lovely flat backed pearls to create a textural treat for the fingers and the eyes. I love the resulting interplay between matte and shiny surfaces. The resulting volume is five and a half inches wide, eight and a half inches tall, and one half inch deep. We need those measurements in order to determine how to build our presentation case. 
begin the process by marking a center line down an eight and a half by 11 sheet of medium weight chipboard. Make a tick mark on either side of that central line at the two and three quarter inch mark. Next, draw a line three inches from one end of the chipboard and then draw an additional line at two and a quarter inches from that same end of the chipboard sheet. I wanted to create a semicircle divot at the front of my presentation box. So for that, I'm using my Olfa Circle Cutter. It works beautifully. Now, score each of the lines that you marked previously with the exception of the center line. That is for reference only. Do not score it. Gently but firmly bend along those vertical score lines at the exterior edges. A bit of sprayed water against the scored lines can help you here to fold the rigid material. Next, it's time to remove the small rectangles created at the intersection of all of the scored lines. Be careful here as you cut through the heavy material. And at the end of the process, your sheet should look like this. Now you can proceed to bend up both the front and the back of the box. The depth of the box is three quarters of an inch and we'll use that same measurement in order to create an additional score line, three quarters of an inch on the exterior of the original score line. The remaining flap of chipboard will be folded forward to create a channel for the book to slide into. Fold each of the score lines into a 90 degree angle and the result will be the final shape of your box. Trim away the excess chipboard from the side panels and create angle cuts at the top of the front of the channel. Apply adhesive where the folded pieces will intersect Smooth it out, clamp those intersections in place, put moderate pressure on the sidewalls with heavy objects until the adhesive has cured. Adding a bead of super glue along the score lines will greatly increase the durability and rigidity of your completed presentation box. Once the glue is cured, you can smooth out any rough edges with an emery board. I chose to prime my completed box with Rust-Oleum Ultra Cover in semi-gloss black. This will create a perfect base for the added graphics. These images have been laser printed onto good quality, lightweight photo paper. This creates an exceptionally clear image. To protect the images, a good quality spray clear coat is applied over the top. Once the clear coat has thoroughly dried, it's time to apply these emblems to the interior of the front of the box and the exterior of the rear using PVA glue. I really like the graphic power that these two emblems add to the project. Yep, that'll do nicely. Next, it's time to add some metallic accents to the presentation box. I'm snipping apart some beautiful golden Dresden trim and also adding an additional Iron Orchid Designs decor mold casting along the front base of the box. This resin casting and another one just like it are being cut in half at the center point. Then the two halves will be glued back to back in order to create little feet that will help hold my presentation box upright. A metal file makes it easy to flatten the back of the castings, and Fabri-Tac is an excellent choice for an adhesive to hold them firmly together. A couple of clamps and a few hours of curing time and our little presentation box feet are ready to be applied. I've chosen to use a mixture of super glue and Fabri-Tac as my adhesive for this job. Once the feet have been firmly adhered, set the piece aside and allow it to cure for several hours. Once the adhesive is cured, 
you'll have a sturdy and over the top set of feet to hold the presentation case vertically. And what a great way to house Shirley's beautiful novella. Oh yes, that's worthy. To seal and protect the entire box, I'm coating it with a thick layer of triple thick gloss glaze and embedding some cool metal stampings over the corners of the back. Once the triple thick cures completely, that blue cast will disappear. I'm also adding more of the same flat backed pearls used to embellish the book itself and then coating everything in triple thick gloss glaze to seal and protect it. I love that look. Set the piece aside and allow it to cure completely. Shirley, thank you for the wonderful gift of your imagination and the incredibly generous gift you've given all of us with If the Reaper Rides. It was a wonderful experience designing a binding for this lovely novella. I hope that you found this tutorial useful. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Until next time, bye.